one thing. So what's the one thing that you want people challenged by pain to know? So it's always hard to come up with one thing, but I think that, that where I would always start, the one thing I would want people challenged by pain to know is that their pain is real and that they are believed. Because so often people living with pain have been dismissed and um, they may have been told things that make them think that their pain isn't real or that it's all in their head. Um, and so many of, of the ways that we kind of objectify and verify pain put all of the burden on the patients to prove that their pain is real. Um, and so I, I want to flip that script and just have us always start from a place of your pain is real and we believe you because I think that would change the whole, you know, course of, of a therapeutic interaction or a clinical interaction. Um, and provide some really necessary and, and invaluable validation for the person in pain that they often don't get. Like, especially for, for a lot of clinicians, they don't think that giving that explicit validation is that important, but I absolutely think that it is. Because they, they think that it's kind of implicit, and it's not. So, so that's where I would start. Just your pain is real, and you are believed. It might feel like an awkward thing to do, but especially when pain persists for a really long time and people have seen multiple clinicians or healthcare professionals over time, um, it, we tend to take on a lot of the blame for not getting better or for not having answers. And our systems kind of set it up to, to put the, the blame at the foot of the patients. So when someone comes before you, they've had a really difficult journey usually. If, if it's been a years long process or even months long process, it's been a difficult journey up until that point. And they might not have received any of that validation and might be getting some of these messages that their pain isn't real because it can't be seen. It's not visualized on a scan or an x-ray or in some sort of test. Um, it's not able to be objectified in, in some way. And so because it is subjective, it can be doubted because it is invisible. It can be doubted. So I think it's really, really important to make that validation explicit and that belief explicit because so many people have been dabbed and dismissed along their, their journey seeking care for their, for their pain. Yeah, and, and so once that's happened, what, what do you think is the next step? Yeah, I think, so it always starts with validation. And then I think once, we as the person in pain receive validation and, and we feel supported and believed and that our pain is validated and then we as, as people are validated, um, that, that, you know, that that conveys a sense of worth, that, that we're worthy human beings, that we're valued human beings. And I feel like that opens up some capacity in us to be able to take on some new information. Um, and the, the current science, what we know about pain right now is, that there is realistic hope that someone's pain experience can change. And th that's where I would go next, is providing that, that very realistic hope that, that pain can change because our biology is constantly adapting with our new and repeated experiences. And it's empowering to learn that we have some control over what those new and repeated experiences are that could then change our experience of pain too. So it starts with validation and I think that opens up the door to be able to start seeing our pain in a different way and then to be able to see that that there are possible paths forward no matter how long we've been in pain for that experience to change and get better and for us to be able to get back to to living our lives and engaging with the things that we value and are meaningful to us um, that we can still be who we are even if it's a little bit differently than it was before um, but but that there's absolute hope that life gets better and, and that pain can change or experience of pain can change. Yeah, cool. So you're really talking about change rather than, you know, cure. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's a really important distinction. At least it was for me in my own experience because I focused for a really long time on just reducing my pain intensity. I wanted the pain to be gone. Um, it wasn't until I started understanding pain differently because the reason I wanted pain to be gone was because I thought that it meant damage. I thought it meant there was some sort of pathology in there that was really bad that had to be found and be addressed. So when I had these notions of pain equals damage or pain equals some kind of pathology, that's really scary. So of course yeah. you want it gone. 
Um, but when I came to a different understanding of, of pain and, and realizing that it wasn't so scary, it wasn't so threatening to my tissues, to my hip, my pain is in my right hip, um, I started changing my ideas about how to go forward with that. When I knew I wasn't doing more damage to myself with every painful step or painful movement, I was more able to start engaging with things that mattered to me because I wasn't so worried that I was, I was messing up my hip even more, especially after my surgery. Because uh, it's, it's really life limiting when you think you're doing more harm to yourself or more damage to yourself or that things are getting worse because the pain isn't getting better. So for me, I had to change my definition of success. And it wasn't so much tied to reducing my pain intensity. It was more, how do I increase my life around this pain? How do I engage with these activities that are meaningful to me, that make me feel like me? Because when we're in pain, we can become so isolated and withdrawn and so disconnected from the people and the places and the experiences that matter to us and make us feel like ourselves, you know, that we are ourselves in relation to others. And we start to lose that sense of who we are in, in our identity. So being able to engage with things that made me feel like myself, that became my definition of success. And then through that process of re-engaging with life again and having a different understanding of what pain was, um, eventually over time, my pain intensity did go down too. And I don't think that the same would have happened if I kept focusing on reducing my pain intensity first before I got back to living. Because my life was on hold when I was in that place. You know, I wasn't engaging with life, waiting for the pain to be gone. So, so for me, I, I tend to focus more on changing the, the overall experience and our overall, you know, life that we're living and, and measuring success by the things that we can do and the things that we're capable of. Because so much of the healthcare language too is about everything that is wrong with us, all of our disorders and dysfunctions and, you know, tears or whatever it might be. Um, if there was one more thing I could do, it would just be change the language kind of that we use and, and do more to build people up and focus on their adaptability and their resilience and their inherent strength and courage and all of those things that they have um, and that they've had throughout this, this process of pain. So I think the more that we can do that and the more that we can focus on, on living our lives alongside pain, kind of making space for it our experience of life changes and then over time our experience of pain changes as well at least that's been my experience yeah that's awesome if people wanted to learn more about you or your story or or ideas that you're 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 putting out there if people wanted to learn more about some of this stuff where do you think they could find more things what what, what resources might you direct them to yeah, so I've had a blog called mycupajoe.com, M-Y-C-U-P-P-A-J-O.com, that um, that's where I've made sense of my own experiences. So that was me writing, trying to make sense of things, because that's kind of how I put things together. And um, So you can see over the last six years how I've, I've learned new information, how I started integrating that information into my life and in my reflections and insights onto that. So um, that's for connecting with me directly, that's the best place to go. And there's a contact form on there too that goes directly to my email if anyone wanted to reach out to me that way. Um, some other initiatives that I'm involved in right now too that we should be coming out with some really cool stuff is through the International Association for the Study of Pain. We have a new Global Alliance of Pain Patient Advocates Task Force um, where we're integrating that lived experience perspective or that, that patient perspective into the study of, of pain. And so that's a really cool initiative too. Um, and then for any researchers or clinician researchers out there that are looking to partner with patients in research, the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy has a really wonderful, I'm totally biased because I'm one of the co-authors on some <laughs> of the editorials, but an editorial series on partnering with patients in research. Um, so I'd say those are the, the big three. That's fantastic. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time. We'll let you get back to your day. Thanks so much. And thanks for having me. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yep, I do. <laughs> Bye.